Tēnā koutou katoa, nō mai, tēnā koutou katoa, nō mai, haere mai, piki mai ki tēnei hui. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. My name's Eugenie Sage, I'm a Green MP based in Otatahi Christchurch and the Green Party's environment spokesperson. And I'm really looking forward to discussing this really important topic of healthy nature, thriving people and our response to COVID-19 with the fantastic guest panelists whom we've got lined up and whom I'll introduce you to in a moment. So just a few housekeeping notes before we have a karakia and get underway. So this evening we're using the Zoom webinar format and that means that you'll only see me and when we bring the panelists on them. So feel free to fill in the poll on our screen if it's showing for you uh, to let us know what part of the country you're calling from. And in terms of the chat function, you can uh, set up so that you can use it to message me and the panelists. And so feel free to send us any comments or questions that you'd like answered, and we'll do our best to get to some of those at the end. So we're also live streaming this event to YouTube for others to watch there. Kito te rangi marie, o te rangi e tu nei, o papatua nuku e takoto nei. O te taiao e afinei ki runga i a tato, tihei Māori ora. May the peace of the sky above, of the earth below, and the world all around rest upon us. So the format this evening is that I'll ask each of the three panellists to introduce themselves. I'll then give a brief update on what the Greens are working on in government around the environment. And then we'll hear from each of the three panellists about the issues that they see in terms of the opportunities uh, for protecting nature and responding uh, to the COVID-19 world. And then we'll move to answer some of your questions. But before we start, can I just um, acknowledge all of the huge amount of mahi that so many people across Aotearoa do uh, to protect our indigenous plants and wildlife and the places that they live. So just acknowledge you and all of your mahi. Thank you. So it's my pleasure now to introduce our panelists tonight. Um, and first of all, we have Dr. Jan Wright, who is the former Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment and currently Chair of the ambitious Tamanahuna Auraki Conservation Project in the Mackenzie Basin. So Jan, over to you. Thanks. Uh, can everybody hear me? Hello. Yes. Um, as uh, Janie said, I'm chair of the Tamanahuna uh, Araki project, and that's uh, what I'm sharing with you tonight. Uh, it's a collaboration between DOC and a bunch of philanthropists at Araki National Park, Mount Cook, and the Upper Mackenzie Basin. And Tamanahuna, the name for the Upper Mackenzie Basin, means the place of enlightenment. Huge area, we're in a three year feasibility stage, um, we've done a lot of research, we've done some work to save special braided river birds. And in terms of COVID-19 and how it's impacted the work today, I learned that we have to stop killing rabbits, but we're allowed to go on uh, following the hedgehogs and working out how they behave. So I um, uh, hope to find out more about that soon, but thank you. Thanks very much, Jan. Uh, in terms of those of you who've tuned in, it looks like 6% are from Northland and Craig Salmon is from Baybush Action uh, near Waitangi in the Bay of Islands. So Craig, over to you to introduce you and uh, Baybush Action. Oh, kia ora. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, well, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, Zoom whānau. Um, uh, ko Craig Salmon ahau, uh, no mata ahau, uh, e noho ana uh, i kaipatiki ahau nai nei. Uh, so kia ora to everyone in the Zoom room and watching live and of course future viewers. Um, my name is Craig Salmon and I am the founding co-trustee and volunteer for Labush Action Trust up here in Taitokoro uh, at a special place called Kaipatiki near Waitangi. Um, so really, you know, COVID-19 really uh, put the brakes on a lot of what we do. Um, we run a, sh a small shop where we sell honey to raise funds for Baybush Action. Uh, and that shop would have multiple groups of tourists coming in um, and buying honey. And we'd talk about the forests and we'd talk about the state of the forest and we'd talk about what we can do to help uh, fix it. And unfortunately, all of that dried up overnight, pretty much. Uh, we went into lockdown um, with the tourist stop coming in. So it really, really 
put the brakes on what we do. Um, but basically what we have done since then, we've done a bit of a reset ourselves. We've had a bit of a break, but we've started to plan for where we are going to go to next in our forest work. And we're also uh, look working on software to try and capture data for the next project, which we're doing, which is a field trial of a new trap. Uh, which is a self-resetting trip, which runs on batteries. So anyway, glad to be here and looking forward to a good call you all. Kia ora, Craig. Thanks very much. Uh, our third panellist this evening is Natalie Jones from Conservation Volunteers. Thanks very much for joining us, Natalie. How's COVID been uh, impacting on your work in uh, Conservation Volunteers? Well, Natalie, koko ingoa. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, for having me kōrero here behalf, on behalf of Conservation Volunteers New Zealand. Um, I am from our Te Whanganui Atara office. Uh, now our vision is to connect people with nature, which we achieve through managing community engagement on a variety of practical conservation projects. So this, this time last year, we were out busy getting ready for the planting season. Um, we planted 150,000 native trees and saw 10,000 volunteers participating in cleanups, planting, and pest control programs around the country. Te Roringa e Oti Ai, by many hands the task is completed, is our whakatauki, and this could not be more true of our mahi. But of course, COVID-19, as uh, Craig said, has put the brakes on um, and brought an abrupt, all of our work to an abrupt halt for both our staff and our volunteers. We have used this time wisely, and uh, we've used it to think about how we're going to move on and uh, work in the uncertain world that we're now living in. Norera tēnakoto katoa. Kia ora, Natalie. Thanks very much. So um, in terms of what the Green Party is doing at Parliament, obviously one of the key issues has been the response to uh, COVID, and that's been a big part of our focus, supporting initiatives like the wage subsidies in terms of providing our support, and really acknowledge everything that you have done to stay home in order to uh, save lives. And now that we're moving, we've moved into Alert Level 3 and looking forward to uh, going to Alert Level 2. So in terms of the Green Party, you may have seen the announcement at the weekend where we're trying to shape um, the response, particularly the economic recovery response in a COVID world. And the Greens have been at the heart, uh, as our work at the heart of government, calling for an economic stimulus package that is fit for the 21st century, that puts climate, people and nature first with a significant investment in nature-based jobs. So there are a lot of discussions happening uh, between MPs and ministers as we promote uh, this package. And one of the key parts of it is ensuring that we have a record investment in nature for its own sake, because it is nature that provides our essential infrastructure, the water we breathe, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the soil uh, to grow food. So what we've proposed is at least a billion dollars in investment over three years to rapidly scale up our spending on people and nature. And the aim here is to help cushion the impacts of COVID, which will lead to significant unemployment by providing government funds to support local communities, iwi, uh, businesses, uh, uh, non-governmental organisations, councils and DOC to employ an estimated six to 7,000 people across Aotearoa. And this package draws on some great ideas that have been coming in from councils, iwi, uh, environmental organisations over the last couple of weeks for how we kickstart the economic recovery by giving nature a much needed helping hand. And one of the key points is that nature-based jobs can be started relatively quickly and make use of people with skills, people from the tourism sector, who are great at logistics, um, people uh, engagement, and pick up some of those people, particularly in areas that have been really hard hit, like Rotorua and the West Coast. And if we make this investment in nature-based jobs, we can really tackle some of our key challenges, like water pollution, having more streams and waterways fenced, uh, planted, uh, wetlands restored so that they act as sponges to filter uh, water, uh, estuary margins planted to help buffer from sea, uh, sea level rise. So we can invest in these sorts of jobs much more quickly uh, than the planning and design that's required often for hard uh, infrastructure. And this investment in nature-based jobs will create 
thriving native forests, thriving wetlands. These are assets that will last centuries and help suck carbon uh, out of the atmosphere. They'll help ensure that we reduce the need to do pest control in future. Um, they'll buffer areas from sea level rides and they'll provide corridors that enable birds to come back to um, our neighbourhoods. So as well as that, we're doing a whole lot of work on waste, but that's probably the subject of another uh, evening session. So if I could go now to um, our panellists, and before I do that, just um, welcome to everybody who's just joined us, and a reminder uh, that we're also live streaming uh, this korero on YouTube. And the link in the Zoom chat is your opportunity to provide any comments or submit any questions that will come to uh, shortly. Uh, you can also do that on YouTube. Uh, so Jan, starting with you, what's top of your mind uh, in terms of the key issues and the opportunities for better protecting nature while also ensuring that communities can thrive in our COVID uh, world? You're on mute, Jan. <laughs> Sorry. Right. You're right. again. Um, sorry about that. Um, my generation's not so great at these things. Um, I want to be thinking about two, th two things. Um, thinking about recreation and tourism on one hand and biodiversity on the other. And I want to talk about both of those in my five minutes. So I'll go fairly fast. But thinking about the opportunities uh, post-COVID, during some of it, um, for recreation and tourism, I'm thinking particularly of unemployed people, large pool of them. Some of them will be suited to outdoor conservation work, particularly from the forestry sector, some from the tourism sector. My nephew is a case in point and his partner would probably be very embarrassed to know I was talking about him uh, nationally. Um, but he and his partner are trained in uh, outdoor recreation and they're as fit as. Um, I think There'll be short term work, but we need to direct it towards the long term, maintain visitor assets, develop them and set up for the future, improve access, improve making of conservation uh, and more accessible to people. Because I think that's really, really important if we want people to value it, they need to be able to get there. Um, we've had a shovel ready call from the cities, good response from the cities, but we need to make sure workers in the regions, and that's where conservation uh, land helps a lot. I think we should develop a strategy for slow tourism, for international visitors much fewer, but stay longer. That's always been desirable, but there's a greater reason now to get serious about it. You can't come for two weeks and spend the whole time in quarantine. Um, but I want to talk also about local tourism. I think New Zealanders, it seems, will be holidaying at home. They won't have as much money. They won't be staying in Airbnbs. Um, we've seen a big loss in camping grounds in desirable areas <clears throat> because of the increase in property values. Doc's got some great camping grounds. I think there's a potential for more. They need to be affordable and not too far from the main centres. So I see a lot of uh, infrastructure opportunities there. I hope that's not my whole five minutes because I've got more to say. Um, no, it's not. Keep going. Keep going, right. Biodiversity more challenging. I'd like to see a similar mindset of <clears throat> investing for the long term and setting up for the future training and technology, investing in predator control technologies that are more effective and cost effective, nurseries and native plants. Um, I'm interested in community groups. I'm looking forward to hearing from Craig and Natalie. Um, there's potential for giving the unemployed occupation and purpose there. Um, I'm also interested in if any work's been done on the most successful models of community groups. Um, in the long term, <clears throat> this is uh, an idea that I feel quite strongly about, I think we need a population that's passionate about conservation. So who are the people who are passionate about conservation? Well, my experience, first of all, it's those who grew up with it, the children of parents who took them tramping and camping. And who else? My parents were urban. They were not outdoor people. When I was a teenager, I was lucky enough to spend a few days in the high country of Canterbury, and it had a huge impact on me, which is why it's nice to be able to go back now. 13, 14, 15 year olds, it's a very open age. They love being away from home with their peer group, uh, taking them for a week into wilderness, practical skills, science, whole far from the city experience. Of course, some have this opportunity now, probably mainly ones from lower, higher socioeconomic areas, but I'm sure that many don't. So I think another big opportunity is building lodges and conservation areas to give all teenagers that experience regularly each year and create a future population 
where more people are passionate about conservation. Kia ora, Jan, thank you. I mean, one of the things I know Doc's doing at the moment um, with COVID is let nature in, and there are a whole lot of activities on the website, but you're totally right, actually getting out into nature at that young age and then developing that passion for it um, as a result of that. Um, lots of wonderful ideas in there. Craig, um, what, in terms of Bay Bush action, uh, did any of those things that uh, Jan said resonate or in the world of slow tourism uh, in Waitangi, kitty kitty? Yeah, Bay Bush action and COVID. Some thoughts? Yeah, kia ora. Um, yeah, wonderful uh, talk, Jan. That's so what we need is ideas, right? And and those are the kinds of things that are going to help, help us through this crisis. Um, for me, the government definitely needs to start to prioritise the well-being of both nature and people. So because those things are, you know, inextricably intertwined, they, they are the same thing. Uh, they go hand in hand, and, and in prioritising them, um, basically we need to, and I forgive the pun, but we need to kill those two birds with one stone, right? We need to make sure that we are spending money uh, on, on um, really, really meaningful jobs that do more than just give people a pay packet. Uh, so what Jam was saying, suggesting around slow tourism, absolutely agree. Um, and we need to be investing. I mean, the Greens idea with the, the, the high speed rail still can be slow tourism, right? People can spend more time in those areas and travel uh, travel comfortably and safely uh, using minimal fossil fuels. Um, I think you absolutely hit the nail on the head around education. Um, for us, uh, we started a program uh, back uh, about 2000. 14, 15, called Nahiri Toa, where we had a bunch of local kids who were kind of just, you know, running wild. And we and we have this amazing trustee, Stella, who's a local tangata whenua. Uh, she has basically, she, she got a work um, experience with us. Uh, we got a little bit of funding to, to get her to work with Able Action for around three months. From there, she became a uh, trustee she started two businesses uh, where she's taking people into the forest. She's um, showing them, uh, she's teaching them the way Māori used to uh, use the forest for food and for clothing and a whole bunch of different things. And um, basically she's giving them a real, really full, wholesome experience of a Māori worldview of the forest and the Nahiri. But she also shows just how, uh, you know, what a terrible state the forest is in with pests. And she, she just does, does a great job and a service to us for that. Um, so I think that the, in the youth, we really need to be able to share that corridor and, and then to inspire them about the forest. Um, you know, Māori medicines, understanding the trees and how they, how they use them is, a really, really good way to connect with the forest and understand the importance of those trees and to show them that the pests, for example, are eating koi koi, uh, you know, they're destroying parts of the forest. And to be able to share that knowledge is really, really critical. Um, I think that that priority is absolutely, is absolutely key. Um, the work needs to happen now. This has actually been 25 years uh, of neglect in a sense, uh, um, where we have really not got a handle on how bad things are out there in the forests. Um, interestingly, I just gotta just gotta say a few things. You know, we just had a lockdown for four weeks where we probably created the biggest marine reserve or marine protected area uh, that New Zealand will probably ever see. Um, you know, but no one, no one, you know, they might have missed going out fishing, but they did that because it was really, really important. And so, you know, we didn't go fishing because we wanted to protect ourselves from COVID. Well, we need to start to think about the marine protected areas. We need to go wider than just our forests. We need to really, really uh, inspire people about all of those things. We, we went through some of the cleanest air we have seen in decades because we weren't driving our cars anywhere. You know, all of those things really, really make an enormous difference to our, our well-being. So I, I think this opportunity becomes um, 
one of the best opportunities we're ever going to have to tackle these issues. And what we've seen is how good it can be, how good it can be. We've had nature coming into our backyards. You know, we've all experienced this kind of peace and tranquilness and been able to take a breath of fresh air and actually start to rethink how we go forward from here. So, you know, I'm really, really, really inspired by the opportunity. Kia ora, Craig. Um, really good points. Yes, I've been wondering too how fish were thriving with that removal of the uh, fishing pressure. So uh, thank you. Uh, Natalie, what's on top for you in terms of conservation volunteers and the response to COVID and some of the challenges and opportunities there? Um, so as I said before, of course, most of our work is done in the field. So on any um, given pre-COVID day, we'd have staff uh, managing projects of anywhere between 10 to 100 people, about planting trees, removing pest weeds, running trap lines, cleaning up local beaches, working side by side with our community, businesses, schools, as well as international and local volunteers. So as you can imagine, uh, while the country's been uh, staying at home, our ability to deliver on projects has been severely disrupted. March and April are usually times where we'd be checking, um, sorry, collecting seed, propagating seedlings, and getting ready for the upcoming very busy planting season. Of course, this year we're expecting to see far fewer volunteers for the foreseeable future, actually, um, due to travel restrictions. Our concerns for health and safety means that it's unlikely we'll be running large volunteering events this year, which has made us rethink how we're going to deliver on key projects, such as our national tree planting program funded by Billion Trees. We are looking at employ employing teams of planters and making volunteer opportunities safe and manageable when alert levels allow for this. Despite this, the lockdown has given us an unexpected time to actually breathe, an opportunity to diversify, to adapt, and to engage with a wider audience in the conservation conversation. So while we were unable to be out in the field, our team was all working from home, working hard to make con conversation accessible um, to people at home and in their bubbles, much like um, the work uh, you spoke of before with Doc. Um, so we were connecting via video chats and creating resources um, so people could create a home for nature in, in their own backyard. So we run a, a employment pathways program called Conservation Work Skills in partnership with the Ministry of Social Development. And pre-COVID-19, we saw 75% of participants going directly into long-term sustainable employment. Thanks to the support we've received from government and council, this program is still on track to expand to 15 locations across Aotearoa, giving us the capacity to provide training and important conservation mahi for around 200 people. Our further funding becomes available for green initiatives such as this, trapping, planting and fencing waterways. There will be thousands of people redeployed around Aotearoa and a significant amount of people power to creating the cleaner, greener country that we want to see. Sure, and, and, oh, sorry. Go on. <laughs> um, I am of course concerned that as the economy struggles to get going again, that local pools of funding will be directed away from conservation and sustainable business practices uh, will fall to the wayside um, as we attempt to return to business as usual. In tough economic times, experiences tells us that the environment becomes a luxury rather than the absolutely critical infrastructure underpinning all human activity that it is. Um, I really appreciate um, that uh, Marama's statement that we need to invest in nature as Aotearoa's essential infrastructure, because the way forward just isn't to invest in traditional infrastructure like motorways, but in clean renewable energy, zero waste initiatives, onshore recycling, and of course the regeneration of our forests and natural resources. But with the un inevitable rise in unemployment, our people are going to be struggling uh, and the benefits of nature on mental health and well-being now more than ever should not be underestimated. For many New Zealanders, the big slowdown has been a time to reconnect with Papa Tuanuku. It's given people the opportunity to think about the type of world that we actually want to see, not just for ourselves, but for future generations. People are enjoying breathing in that fresh, clean air and loving seeing nature returning to our backyards and to our city centres. We don't want business to return as usual at the cost of the environment. 
And uh, just supporting what Craig said earlier, I believe that at all stages of COVID-19 recovery, it's important to acknowledge Mātauranga Māori as a framework for how we can live um, in harmony with Papatuanuku in Aotearoa. We are being given a once in a lifetime chance to place Aotearoa on a greener path and to preserve our unique and valuable native ecosystems for generations to come. Kia ora, Natalie. Um, really, some really good um, ideas in there and synthesising some of the key concepts. Um, just before we move to questions, Jan, because you were at the start and probably had a bit less time, is there anything you would like to add to the comments that uh, Natalie and Craig have made? Oh, um, not really. I mean, I agree with everything you're saying. Uh, I must say that in terms of, of loving what uh, has occurred in terms of, of, of them stopping. Uh, I heard a wonderful, I've had wonderful bike rides around Christchurch in the autumn. It's just been absolutely fabulous. Um, so, yeah, it has been this sort of strange pause and think period. And I'm just hoping too that we won't go back to business as usual. I think we can all endorse that. Um, and now just uh, turning to some of the questions that people have been putting in on the uh, Zoom chat. One of them is um, that people are keen to hear what the panellists think about Aotearoa as an ecotourism destination for limited numbers and putting more emphasis on that. And I know the current Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment, uh, Simon Upton, did a report on that uh, prior to Christmas. Uh, but Craig, with you being based in an area where there's a lot of tourism, what are your thoughts on um, a more limited uh, focus there? Yeah, I mean, it's high end, um, high value tourism. Uh, I think too that generally what we've found is that when people um, take some of the tours that we do, they already have an appreciation for nature. They are really, really engaged in the tourism that we take them through and they, they buy that for that reason. Um, so I think for, for New Zealand, for Aotearoa to, to go down that path, absolutely. We have absolutely those opportunities. Managing it through the COVID um, issue that we have at the moment and, and internationally, obviously, it's turmoil um, with a lot of places is still in lockdown and, and struggling with this problem. Um, it is going to be a challenge. Uh, one thing I would like to really say is that Often tourism in New Zealand is um, often looked as a kind of chunk of money that comes in from offshore. But local tourism, we don't often count those trips to Fiji or up to the islands or overseas that many, many New Zealanders do take that will no longer happen for a very long time. So what I'm really saying is that I'm really encouraging lots and lots local tourism when we get to a level uh, of the lockdown that that's that's enabled we we really go out and explore New Zealand we appreciate what we've really got here and start spending your money locally because that's what's going to really help us get through this um, for us as Babush Action uh, uh, doing this work in the forest. You know, we, we work on a very concentrated area, but what we also do is we have this wonderful trapping network through the backyards of people's homes. And all of it makes a difference. So what we're basically creating in, in the Paihe region and Waitangi and that is uh, an area where nature enters into the lives of those people that are living there and the tourists that come up and visit. So, yeah. so much of that work that the locals have done uh, is of benefit in a much, much wider and broader scope than people really realise. So um, that's again why we need to go with our strengths uh, and, and really make a, try and make a difference and try and help out the tourism sector as much as possible by travelling locally and, and doing that tourism locally. Into the homes. Thanks very much, Craig. Um, Jan, in terms of um, all of the work that Tamanahuna Auraki is doing in the Mackenzie Basin, and that being a major uh, visitor and tourism node, have you got any thoughts on how we shape future tourism in Aotearoa now that we've had this pause with COVID? Well, I think that distinction between local and uh, offshore is important when you're thinking of a strategy. Um, the local tourism, that's why I'm very keen on the idea of affordable camping grounds in really interesting places, because I think 
people aren't going to have as much money. And I think we, we could see a revival of that. DOC already does valuable work there, but I think there's a lot more to do. Um, in terms of international tourism, um, if we do form this bubble with Australia, we may have a lot of Australians coming here uh, and uh, there's something to build on there. But I think the key for ecotourism, although I see one of the comments is that it's an oxymoron, I just made me smile. Um, the idea there is, that to me, that is kind of key because uh, it's a given in economics that value lies in scarcity and wilderness worldwide is increasingly scarce. So it seems to me that our wilderness, we can look after it, is going to become over the time more and more valuable. And so in terms of the tourism experience coming from overseas, I think we want people to have quality experiences and we need to take a focus off quantity, number of tourists and get fewer but doing it slow, slowly. Uh, so that's those things go together for me there. Thanks, Jan. I noticed some uh, question from Elaine. What about virtual tourism? Natalie, with the work that conservation volunteers have been doing in terms of virtual resources, what are your thoughts about virtual tourism? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. We can certainly give our team leaders a little GoPro and stream live to people all over the world. Um, yeah, and no, I think this lockdown has definitely made all of us just think differently about how we not only travel within our own communities but certainly around the world um, so yeah if people are relying more heavily on um, technology and um, yeah and, and and I think um, just the huge number of people that are now tuning into the Department of Conservation's webcam on the yeah. Tauroa Head Royal mm -hmm. Albatross to follow mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. uh, and just the number of meetings that we're having digitally that reduces the need um, for travel. So we've had a, another question um, about how do the panel think we can reduce our reliance on economic growth based primarily on consumption? Um, Craig, would you like to have a crack at that? What do you think are the key things to reduce um, economic growth based primarily on consumption? Yeah, good question. Um, it's it's almost a cultural issue, I think, um, more than anything else. Um, and understanding that when when something is enough, you know, what we really need. I think part of our problem has been that we have driven our uh, our products to a price um, driven um, uh, point where they're actually not the quality they used to be. I mean, I said, you know, certainly shoes and things like that are often just really trashy. And I think part of the problem is that actually uh, standards uh, have really got quite low. Um, also, as you know, consumers, we we are driven by lower wages to buy lower products. And all of this thing is this kind of big, unfortunate cycle of globalization. Um, buying something that's locally made that lasts for ages and does the job really, really well gives us a sort of feeling of a much better feeling when we buy it. And, and certainly repairing uh, and, 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 and taking a product that had, had maybe been damaged and rather than throw it away, um, repairing it, those kind of things are the way we need to kind of move away. But I think it's a much more cultural issue than um, than say uh, something that we're just going to solve necessarily overnight like that. Thanks, Craig. Um, Jan, do you have some thoughts on that? Well, that's an absolutely massive question that uh, has arisen in, <laughs> through my working life. Um, uh, really, really hard. Um, one of the problems, I think, is that politically everything always reverts to GNP, which is a measure of busyness rather than a measure of real wealth. Um, and I don't know how we wean all the MPs off that. Or uh, So I don't know. It's really, really hard. And the media don't help. I mean, one of the things that has really um, amazed me, it, well, I could almost use the word appalled me, watching uh, the television news is, is, is the, the commentators talking about takeaways as if you know, people who were lining up for takeaways were to be congratulated for being cool. Um, and this is madness. Um, so I don't know. Um, look, get the teenagers out into the wilderness and try and build some other values. 
Thank you. GMP is a measure of busyness. I think, though, that what government has done with the four well-beings um, yes. in terms of natural capital, social, um, environmental, and economic, and Treasury actually using that as a lens to analyse um, the economy is a start. Um, Natalie, do you have any thoughts in terms of just moving away from the consumption uh, preoccupation? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we need to stop passing costs on to future generations um, in the form of polluted fresh waters, um, rubbish dumps that are overflowing into our oceans and degraded soils. We've been taking and giving very little back for such a long time that now is really the time to invest in these green, op green opportunities. And it's the time to redirect workers to protecting and restoring the environment for sure. Um, so another question that's come in is what about a policy to increase marine reserves to be equal in percentage to uh, conservation land? So there's a third of Aotearoa that is protected as conservation land, but less than 1% of our EEZ and marine protected areas. Brad, you made some comments about marine protection. Um, the government uh, is looking to introduce uh, a discussion document to actually change uh, our marine protected areas legislation. But in the Bay of Islands, some of the issues with dolphins and just overfishing there, do you want to comment on the importance of uh, marine protection there? Completely, right? So when I first turned up into the Bay of Islands, um, there was a group called Fish Forever uh, working strongly to try and achieve 10% of the bay to become marine protected areas. Um, it's been a real struggle. Uh, it's, it's a completely different story when we talk about the oceans uh, to talking about the forests. So for some reason, well, it's pretty obvious, but everyone gets the idea that rats need to be taken out. They're not a food source for people. There's no real cultural significance um, other than perhaps kiori. There's, there's, it's an easy sell for most people. Part of the problem with obviously uh, setting up marine reserves is that culturally fishing is, is very much touted as, as the thing to do sport wise and a whole bunch of people get involved with it. Um, so it's complicated. I would, you know, I, I often ask the question because I was involved with Fish Forever for a long time. Um, if, if we only could fish in 10% of the bay, would we catch less fish? And a lot of people were really stumped by that question. They basically were like, well, of course, there'll be lots of more fish, you know, having little baby fish. And so then there's going to be lots more fish. And so would I actually catch less fish? And it is a good question to kind of get people thinking about marine reserves and how they can operate. Um, I do hope that the marine protected um, uh, legislation comes through very quickly. We are desperate for that uh, change in legislation so that we can really uh, properly create some amazing different techniques to preserve our marine environment. Um, Rahui, um, Matai Tai, using traditional Māori techniques along with obviously marine, you know, fully marine protected areas, um, really necessary. So yeah, let's go for it. Let's do it. This is the time. We've shown it. We can do it. Thanks, Craig. Um, Natalie, in terms of conservation volunteers, um, any of your work in the marine space and your thoughts on uh, more marine protected areas? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I whole, whole, wholeheartedly support protecting more marine areas. Um, we want to be able to go to our moana and use it to collect kai moana, to feed our families. Um, also for those cleaner, greener tourism um, options and of course for recreation. I mean, I've been going to the beach my whole life. It's it's part of who I am. Um, but yeah, everything's intrinsically linked. So of course, all the conservation mahi that we're doing on land is going to affect the health of our oceans as well. So it's yeah, so closely linked, um, but definitely all four more marine reserves. It's pretty shocking how, how little we have protected. Kia ora. Jan, um, just in terms of a COVID world and people observing more, uh, or having time to observe nature in their backyards, uh, and then thinking about the sea space where we haven't been able to go swimming until now. Have you got any thoughts on marine protection and how that fits in a COVID world? Or some well, of the challenges there? Yeah, I, I, uh, you're just dropping this on me. I haven't been thinking about it for a while, but no, certainly um, we are way behind in terms of our marine protection, but it seems to be extraordinarily difficult to get marine protected areas. Um, so, 
Um, I don't know. I can't just answer that on the fly, but I absolutely agree. We need more. I don't know what I don't know what the solution is. I think Craig had a few ideas. Um, one of the other questions that's come through, just going back to the tourism theme, is how do we build issues of equity into slow tourism um, initiatives? And how can this be more extensively, um, or how can the opportunity to visit protected lands be more available to all New Zealanders? I think Jan, you had the suggestion around uh, experiences in the uh, outdoors for younger people, more environmental education. But do uh, Natalie, do you have any thoughts on equity issues? I think I might pass that one back to Craig. Like you said, he seemed to have um, some pretty big thoughts on that one. Craig. Yeah, um, it, it is always tricky with equity um, uh, for certainly if you're talking about tourism, because you're trying to encourage a high end market to come in and spend the money so that we can then hopefully distribute that uh, a lot more evenly amongst ourselves. Um, I think absolutely Jan is right. Like if we can uh, make sure that uh, spaces for nature are reserved where, where they can be observed by our local people, um, local kids and that sort of stuff and, and making sure that that kind of school camps where there's a lot of good education around the issues around forests um, and making sure that uh, we do keep the access to our docklands that we do pride ourselves on. Um, I think that that's really, really key to creating that sort of equality between those uh, two spaces. So I, I think New Zealand actually has done that extremely well. We haven't, um, you know, uh, developed um, kind of really beautiful tourist spots uh, around the country and we have kept them really natural. So I, I would hate us to go in that direction to try and lure high value tourists over. I think what people are actually looking for, which is exactly what Jan alluded to, is it is a unique and an authentic experience. And I think that's what we've really got to trade on is that it can be rough. It can doesn't have to have lighting actually, you know, if I think about Bongaroa and Lane Cove, it's one of my favorite places to go. Uh, and, and, you know, you've got to take your own torches and there's no power. It's wonderful. So I, I don't think we should be trying trying to create something that's not us uh, at all and, and selling it. That's not the way to do it. I think we need to take what we love uh, and hopefully be able to make sure that that's still accessible and available to all of New Zealand, but we'll basically drag those other people and uh, we'll pay a good amount of money to get there and to be nurtured through and learn about what's unique about New Zealand. So. Thanks, Craig. Um, Richard has asked, or he said, we need to link up the efforts of all our environmental organisations. Um, Jan, can I ask you to talk a bit about how Te Manahuna Aoraki has done that, given that you're working with landholders, with iwi, um, philanthropic organisations like the Next Foundations. How do we get that linkage between people from different uh, backgrounds and interests to work on a, a common objective? Well, it's a bit early to ask me that with regard to Tamanahuna because we're, we're really in the early stages of that. But certainly one of the things that's very interesting about it, um, particularly with the landowners, team holders, is because we have an area that we are trying to uh, preserve, but it's also a working area where people live and work. And so that old system where conservation land, where we did conservation was separate from that. Um, is, is changing. So that's particularly interesting. It's much more of a, an overseas model. You have a mixed, mixed sort of use of the land. Um, but can, I wouldn't mind if I could just make a comment about equity and, and slow tourism, if I could mm. cut back to that without Certainly. Being too, too disturbing. Um, I, I know someone who does slow tourism, has a slow tourism business. And I think there are small groups of people who are well healed, admittedly, coming from overseas, but staying for a considerable time. And because because they pay well, you can give them a really good in-depth experience, including a cultural experience, and you can pay the work as well, not on the minimum wage. And so I think that if you have slow, the international tourism that we should seek is actually the relatively wealthy people. Um, so there's a certain amount of that anyway, and, all, and it does flow through to more equitable working conditions within the industry. 
thanks, Jan. Um, one of the questions that Hannah has asked um, is what, if any, are the criteria for the government um, investment projects to uh, boost the economy coming out of COVID? Um, and is the environment one of the criteria? And are nature-based uh, solutions being prioritised over grey uh, infrastructure projects? Uh, just to say to Hannah and others that that is one of the key um, priorities for investment in moving our economy towards a low emissions, climate friendly economy, in reducing waste and improving the prospects for our indigenous uh, plants and wildlife and nature that the Green Party is uh, pushing. And that's why projects like um, investing in nature to create jobs, uh, recognising that unemployment will be one of the results of COVID uh, is something that we are championing with uh, other ministers there is a budget obviously coming out uh, on the 14th of May. Uh, there are discussions happening at the moment, but it's something we'll continue to champion because we really do need to shift the priorities for spending um, so that we recognise that we depend on healthy nature and that we have a, uh, when the environment's healthy, we all uh, prosper. And it is the basis of our export uh, economy and it has been the basis of tourism. So it's something that we are promoting strongly Someone else asked how we um, get more public profile for that. It's just being involved in kōrero like this one and talking about it with others and building up that public mandate uh, for this investment. So um, one of the other um, questions that's come through, how can we support the creation of native biomes in uh, cities and uh, towns? So how can, um, maybe turning to you, Natalie, in terms of getting nature in urban areas, uh, how does conservation volunteers work to uh, encourage that? Mm. Also being based in Wellington, of course, we're incredibly lucky to have the Wellington Town Belt, which I don't have exact numbers for you, but huge amounts of people rely on that as their outdoor space for recreation and to get back in touch with nature. So that's where we're focusing our efforts. We're making it really easy for people to get in touch with nature. Um, we offer free transport or people who can simply walk up to the forest and they can get involved more or less in conservation in their backyards and see the effects of it. I mean, I've heard from, um, I'm not a local born and bred Wellingtonian myself, but people that have lived here for a lot longer than I have tell stories about how when, you know, seeing a tui was um, something you could only dream of, whereas now we see entire trees in the city centre full of them. Myself, I live on the ninth floor of an apartment building in the city centre with a good view of the forest and a glimpse of the ocean. But I can see, especially during lockdown, I saw and heard kaka flying right through our city centre um, on their way to and from um, the town south and then linking around with Zealandia. So yeah, it's pretty amazing. We can make a home for nature in our cities. COVID-19 has showed us that. The, in the big slowdown, wildlife came out. We saw Karerera, the New Zealand native falcon um, in the Wellington CBD. We had a humpback whale um, and a sunfish out in our harbour the other day. So yeah, it is possible making it easy and um, accessible for everybody in our cities. Kia ora, Natalie. Craig, do you have any comments on that? No, I think that's, that's absolutely what we need to do. Um, the, the whole concept of slowing the world down a bit is, is what COVID's given us, you know, the opportunity to see. Um, I mean, just even seeing the photographs um, of places in India where the pollution was horrendous and, and suddenly clear skies, all of it, you know, what, what many, you know, environmentalists have been saying for decades, it's all true. We just need to start to change. Um, I, I think, you know, getting involved locally, we, we have a, an amazing group of about 150 people up here in Waihia uh, that have done an awesome job in the backyard. And they really create those corridors that Eugenie was talking about. You, you know, they, they connect um, from the forest through down to the ocean. They make all of the difference in those spaces. We, you know, we've got a tragedy happening with seabirds uh, on the mainland. We've got, um, you know, right right through when we first arrived here, there were, we had, I think, maybe one distant Kiwi. Now we've got dozens of Kiwi and they call outside my bedroom window. I am in the forest, I'm not down in the, down in the town. Um, but to move from having virtually no dawn chorus to this 
vibrant wake up call in the morning. I mean, I've moved my whole schedule. So I get up pretty much at 5.30. This is late for me, right? So I get up at 5.30 in the morning because the birds are up and they're like, get up, get up, get up. You know, we've got to do this thing. So um, I, I just think that it, it, all of it's a benefit to our well-being. You know, that there is some really, actually some really, really good studies um, that have proven that interacting with nature uh, is really, really important for people's well-being. And, uh, and I, I think COVID's kind of shown us a lot of that, actually. So. Thanks, Craig. Um, Jan, in terms of your bike rides around Autumnal Christchurch, have you noticed um, opportunities to bring nature back uh, a bit more into the city? Well, I've discovered some places where nature has been brought back into the city um, by volunteers. Um, so some tremendous little pockets of uh, planting all over the place. Um, but, you know, it, it has been this change in behaviour where people are actually out enjoying it. Uh, and that, that's been wonderful, whole families on bikes. So I think that um, our cities are actually quite transformed by, by native partners and, um, and a lot of that's been done by volunteers. I think they're very different from what they were a few years ago. And yeah. I think people um, just... Uh, enjoying being able to walk or bike safely on roads and therefore one of the uh, policies that Julianne Gent has announced recently is a fund that enables local councils to apply to the NZCA TA to broaden footpaths so that there is more space for walking and cycling because it's really lovely having that space without having to compete with cars. Sorry Natalie were you about to comment there? Oh, yeah I was just going to say that a, a big mihi and recognition to the hundreds and thousands of conservation um, community groups that we have working all around the country. They're absolutely an integral part of bringing nature back into our cities whether it's you know a single retiree just looking after their little patch of reserve backing onto their house or young students, new migrants getting involved, it's making a huge impact and we couldn't do it without them. Kia I really would like to endorse that because it is all that voluntary work and that connection that people make with neighbours, with people in their community and make new friends by getting involved and in whether it's trapping predators or controlling old man's beard and other weeds. And just a final question uh, from someone that if they really want to get uh, involved, how can they help? Uh, and I think there are lots of uh, predator-free groups, lots of community organisations like Forest and Bird, uh, groups like uh, Conservation Volunteers, Bay Bush Action, uh, that just do a bit of a web search, find your local group, and you make new friends as well as doing something uh, that's really meaningful. So just in the few minutes that we've got remaining, um, we'll just invite each of the panellists to uh, have some concluding thoughts about uh, just COVID, and really opportunities now looking to the future um, for how we make the best use of this thinking time that we've had uh, and the way we have done things so very differently in order to save lives and recognising both the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis, how much we can do things differently um, to actually protect the climate and protect Papa Tuanuku. So um, Craig, do you have any concluding comments? Um, I think, there's a few things I really want to basically let the powers that be know, which is that the Greens Fund is brave. It's absolutely necessary. Um, but we've got to think of it as being more than just digging holes and planting trees. This is a reset. This is talking about being able to look at things like, for example, in the pest control space. Um, we want to be uh, investing in technology um, there's talk of using things like uh, artificial intelligence to determine what pest is coming into a trap. There's all sorts of monitoring tools that we need developed to make sure that we're hitting those just pests when we need to hit them at the right times. All of that needs training. We need to expand the amount of work that, um, uh, you know, we, we've obviously got the development of these traps and so forth that need to happen. But one thing that I'd say is that that is, that is really potentially export earnings, because this isn't just a unique problem to New Zealand. We have uh, this issue, but so many other countries do as well. So there's a lot of export revenue, there's knowledge sharing, there's also knowledge exporting um, that can be done uh, just all around the world. So again, take what we're really good at, and we are really, really good at pest control. We're really, really good at biodiversity protection. So let's expand that. Let's 
you know, work on this predator-free solution and, and just bring all the people together, bring all hapu and, and work on the te triti principles that will create this collaboration to solve all of these problems. And, you know, there's things right now that are happening. There's PAP trials down the Auckland Islands that we desperately need to get through to make sure that we have this technology continually coming through and being able to be applied in various ways. It's about having a lot of tools in the kitty. And when you develop those, it's, it's spending that money locally. You know, I'd love to say this, basically when, when the US government spends money with NASA, they spend it on earth, they never spend it in space, right? So think about that, how we can spend this money locally. We're not buying big infrastructure and importing it to build roads. We're actually using our local skills, our local talent, and we're developing stuff that works for us. So that's that's my kind of concluding thoughts. To and and you know we need this billion dollars to come through because those pests aren't going to stop. So. Kia ora, Craig. Kia ora, Natalie. Um, yeah, I just wanted to finish off by saying that um, if anything, I believe the slowdown has showed every New Zealander that we need nature in our lives. We need that opportunity um, to be able to get out into clean, green spaces. Um, and the benefits to our mental health and physical health should not be underestimated. Um, so I really do want to encourage those of you, that person who um, said before, how do I get involved? Reach out to your local community group. Um, reach out to the conservation hubs like Conservation Volunteers New Zealand or find one in your local area and put this newfound energy um, from the, the lockdown into a cleaner, greener future, not just for us, but obviously for future generations as well. Kia ora. Kia ora, Natalie. Thank you. Jan. Um, I've been thinking quite a lot about what we don't do, uh, you know, rather than to prevent us reverting to business as usual. And... Um, thinking of particularly in the climate change space. So here we are Zooming instead of traveling around by planes and getting together physically. Now, how, how is that going to play out in the future? I think that in a year or two, we'll look back at Zoom and see it as incredibly primitive. We might be beaming three dimensional holograms of virtual people into rooms. So you actually can hardly tell as you look around the room, who's a real person, who's a virtual person. I don't know. I'm sure that's quite within the reach of technology. And so I think that that decrease in plane travel has been enormously helpful, but it applies internationally. We shouldn't still be building convention centres, for goodness sake. Um, should Christchurch still be planning to borrow millions and millions of dollars and build a stadium? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think it's relevant. Are we going to what are large groups of people wanting to go, going to get together in the future? Um, I just don't think that's what our future's like. So we have to look at some of these shovel-ready projects as well, rather than just the, the green things we would like to happen, and think of some of those other ones and say, well, really, do we really want that to happen? Um, so, um, yep, that's what I've been thinking about a lot. Thank you, Jan. A real opportunity to think of what we really want, the world we really want in Aotearoa, and to shape it uh, accordingly. Can I thank you, uh, Jan, Natalie, and Craig, uh, for your comments and contribution this evening? Can I thank everyone who has joined us? I hope you found the Koriro uh, interesting. And if you'd like to share your ideas about your vision, for a healthy, thriving Aotearoa. We've got a survey open at the moment, um, which is being posted on the chat bar in Zoom and YouTube. And we'd like to close now and thank you all with a karakia. Tutuwa mai i runga, tutuwa mai i raro, tutuwa mai i roto, tutuwa mai i waho, kia tō e, kia tō ai, te Māori tū, te Māori ora, ki te katoa, Homie, huie, taikie. Kia ora, take care. Kia ora, kumarie.